Good morning, Claire. Hi. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Good, good to see you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Kylie's mom. Hi, Hi. nice to meet you. I'll, um, I'll go to mute and I'll stop video and all that. So um, later, like soon. Are you Allison? I'm Fern. Um, okay. Allison is a dear friend and colleague of mine uh, okay. at the cool. Institute. And so I have friendships and gotten hooked up with their supervisors. Uh, Great. Hmm. OK. You're breaking up a little. So I'm going to go to mute and just like, you know, not have so much traffic. You know what I mean? okay. morning. Good morning. Buenos dias. Buenos dias, Luisa. Voy a quitar el video para mejor. Yes, Good morning, Margaret. Morning. Good morning. Hi, Patricia. Good to see you. Nice to, you. to meet you a little bit more since we'd only talked on the phone before. I'm nervous. <laughs> well, I'm sure it's going to be great. I know this format is um, maybe still a little different for some of us. Yeah, it just felt like the time went so fast and then all of a sudden um, it's time for the presentation. So um, it's good though. Yeah, the, the well, you're all great. pioneers in um, this virtual realm. So yeah. I'm really looking forward. The project was good. Yeah, great. it was really interesting, really interesting work. And of course, I've already told you that Allison was fabulous to work with. Yeah. Wonderful. All right, and welcome, Lori and Lisa. Or how do you want us to be? Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna give a few more minutes and I'll give a little intro. Uh, we are gonna be recording um, so that we can share this later. And here's Allie. Um, and once we're gonna get started, I'll ask everybody, and hi, Caitlin, uh, to turn off their microphone, except the person presenting. Um, okay. And then we'll have uh, time for questions uh, after each presentation. Okay. So still waiting on some folks. Morning, Allison. Good morning. Hi, Leslie. Work. Hey. So. Is the sound still working? Yes. Uh -huh. I can hear you. Yeah. Did you get on yet? Well, the link is not working. No, I can't get onto it. Well, what should I do? See if you can send it to my other email. I wore uh, Monteverdi hummingbirds for the. Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Fern, how many um, uh, virtual interns are there? Um, there are five. And huh? let me make sure that I got everybody in this. Yep. Um, yeah, it shows up as fewer presentations in the what I put in the chat. My apologies, because I realized I didn't separate um, Claire's presentation out. So we have four presentations uh, corresponding to five interns. Um, 
as two of Allie's will be presenting together. Okay, there's Kai and Deb. All right, well, I think we can go ahead and get started and other folks can join um, if they show up. And here's Dina, thank you. Uh, all right, welcome everyone. This is new and exciting. Um, welcome to our first ever virtual internship symposium. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here. And I wish we could all be here in person, of course. And I hope those of you who haven't been to Monteverde will be able to come and visit us one day. Um, but I am thrilled at how this has gone so far and really looking forward to the presentations. Uh, so I'm Fern Perkins. I'm the academic director at the Monteverde Institute. And I have worked kind of behind the scenes on, uh, on getting these virtual internships um, set up and then interns and supervisors have run with them. So really that's where the most interesting work has happened. Um, and I'm honored to have been a part of, of helping that happen. Uh, welcome to everyone. I am recording this session. Um, I wanna make everyone aware of that because normally we would uh, stream our intern presentations on Facebook Live. Uh, and so now we'll have this recording that we can share um, through the different channels that we usually use to um, share this type of presentation. Uh, if everyone will have their microphones turned off um, during the presentations, and then if there are any questions in the process that have to do with language, uh, you can put them in the chat and I will try to answer them. Um, I know we have a couple of presentations that the, the slides are in Spanish. Um, we have one where the slides are in Spanish and the presentation is in English. Um, and another benefit of recording this is that maybe someday we can put some subtitles to it. Uh, and if you want to ask after the pre each presentation, we'll take a time for some questions and answers. Um, okay. We've got a few more tuning in. Great, great to see everybody here. Uh, entonces, bienvenidos. Um, Hay alguien que no habla inglés aquí hasta el momento. Mario, usted habla inglés. All right, we'll see. And Susie's here, great. Um, yep, I'm here. <laughs> welcome. Yeah, All right, so here. just a little bit of background uh, about the Monteverde Institute and our internship program. Um, we uh, were founded in 1986 as I think many or all of you know, um, as a response to changes occurring in the community with the advent of tourism um, and absence of a local government. And we have worked on academic programs and community programs and research um, since that time. And I think that these internships are a great example of how those three um, are interwoven, which is really the goal uh, of, of all the programs that I develop in the academic department. Um, there's definitely an academic component. Uh, at least some of these interns are getting academic credit or other recognition um, to advance in the pursuit of their degrees. Uh, there's also a research component, as you'll see, especially in the interns um, from this summer, they're definitely uh, related to some really cool ongoing research projects in the Monteverde area, um, in both the social and natural sciences. And they are all contributing to really important work that's happening in the community um, in response to the pandemic, but also uh, in a variety of challenges that we face in conservation. And so I wanna thank the interns and the supervisors um, for advancing um, our work here at the Institute through, um, Just a through the work that you've done together this summer. All right. Okay. So. What? Leslie's on there, yeah. Uh huh. If I can get yeah, everyone no. to and mute the their microphone, there. I actually I might be able to do that for you. Okay. <laughs> um. So I put in the chat section a little um, uh, agenda. So our first presentation is going to be uh, environmental issues in the Costa Rican media during the COVID nineteen pandemic by Patricia Waters and Caitlin Tagliabue, um, who worked with Allison Cantor, uh, who is a collaborator of the Monteverde Institute and resident of the zone. Um, 
So uh, I don't know, Allison, if you want to give any intro, uh, if not, I will um, hand it over to Patricia and Caitlin. I think that they're going to give uh, uh, their own introduction. Hello. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Allison I'm at Kininja Project. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to share my screen, the presentation. Um, yeah. It's giving me a little bit of trouble, so I apologize for this. This is different. Yeah, Patricia, could you try that? Could you try sharing it? It's telling me that it doesn't recognize like my Chrome. Okay. Which is, so I don't know why it's doing that. It's not one of them, it's not any of these. You have to open the file. Can you do it? I don't know where it is. It's right on my um, desktop. There you go. Now, how do I go back to the meeting? Which one is that? I think it's this one. Okay, I'm going to try this. Can I do this? Uh, no, don't do that. Do that. Screen. Nope. Oh, no. I know. I could make it down on this one. Share oh, screen. There you go. Okay. Okay, can people see it now? Okay. Um, so good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining us uh, for this summer internship symposium. Um, our presentation is environmental issues in the Costa Rican media during the COVID-19 pandemic. And my name is Patricia Waters. I attend Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts, and my co-author is um, Caitlin Tagliabu, and she goes to the University of Vermont. So thank you, and I uh, hope you enjoy our presentation. Um, so the purpose of this study is to examine the representation of environmental news in Costa Rican newspapers during the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, Costa Rica is seen as a global leader in environmental issues. And climate change and other issue, environmental issues are often the focus of media reports due to the critical state of the natural environment as a direct result of human activity. It was unclear how the COVID-19 pandemic has have impacted efforts to fight climate change and improve the planet's health, especially during the pandemic. <clears throat> and we used content analysis to quantify the frequency of terms in the Costa Rican media that pertain to the environment. So that this might give us some insight into environmental issues that matter to Costa Ricans during the public health crisis. So in collaboration with the Monteverde Institute, this study explored this research question, what is the connection between COVID-19 and the environment in Costa Rica? Um, since the pandemic began in early 2020, a segment of peer-reviewed literature has focused on the environmental impacts in the wake of this global emergency. And the literature had identified these key themes that I have on the screen, uh, reduced CO2 emissions, air and water quality, <clears throat> reduction in mobility, increased plastic waste, um, health systems, resilience, and opportunities for creating a greener society. 
Um, the severe and sudden reduction of human activity on a global scale illustrates how complex our, ecosystem relation, our ecosystemic relationships are. And in this time of human reduced, reduced human activity, um, it was referred to in some of the literature as the anthropause. Um, the methodology selected for this study reflects an emphasis on both regional, the Monteverde zone, and national context. The main methodology used for this study is content analysis, which is the process of drawing conclusions based off of textual data. In this case, our data were Costa Rican media um, newspaper articles, which we drew from the Tico Times, Seminario Universidad, La Nación, and Zona Alta Medios. We chose to look at the media because um, the media has a large influence on public opinion and public perception. So what we did was we um, searched these four newspapers every day during our internships for articles that related to um, environmental issues. And then we also went back and looked in the archives of these sources from May 1st to July 24th to look at articles that met the inclusion criteria of um, discussing the environment in the headlines. When we found articles that met this criteria, we uploaded them to Zotero Citations Manager. Then we used um, coding to analyze the themes within these articles using deduce uh, mixed methods research platform. Coding is the process of identifying words and phrases within a text that have symbolic meaning. So what we did was we copy and pasted our articles into deduce and then highlighted different words and phrases that were associated with a code. In order to create our code book, we used a collaborative methodology, which means we met as a group to discuss some of the themes that we saw in the articles and created a preliminary code book. Then we coded um, all of the articles for the first time and went back and had another meeting to discuss um, any edits to the code book. After that, we coded two more times. Each article was coded by two collaborators and an inter-rater reliability test was taken through deduce. An inter-rater reliability test determines the level of agreement between the collaborators and the application of the codes. This is really important because it shows that the different collaborators are agreeing on the application of the codes, which makes our results more reliable. Next, we use the deduce analysis tools to look at um, the relationship between the source, language, month, and regional versus national with the um, different codes. Um, so here's um, kind of a consolidated view of our results. Um, these are the overarching themes that came up most in our media samples with the number of times that they were coded. So out of the eight emergent themes, I'm just gonna briefly talk about the top three. So ecological systems was coded most. Um, and it was obvious from reading the articles that conservation efforts are continuing with an awareness of its importance for the economy and for native species such as sloths. There were stories about sloths, about the tufted eagle, and also the return of the large toothed sawfish. And these, um, you know, uh, serve to educate readers about what makes the environment and these creatures unique and how to assist in their survival. Um, air and water quality, um, while an important issue in the literature that we researched, it did not show up that many times in the media sources. Um, and policy and politics, so laws and policies are, are being defended um, to challenge those who want to bring back environmentally unsound practices, such as um, open pit mining and oil exploration. And there was an article about uh, water abuse in a biological reserve. And so those things are, are still uh, being paid attention to. And the Minister of Environment and Energy, uh, in a few articles, reaffirmed his commitment to sustainable development and there was also uh, many references to the work of the national and international environmental organizations. And um, deforestation in Costa Rica and also in Brazil uh, was of great concern. COVID-19, of course, very important. 
Costa Rica has adopted measures to slow the spread with local reporting on how people are adjusting and coping with the restrictions. There were stories on individuals and families that highlight both successes, which was the capacity of the health system in Costa Rica, and problems such as food insecurity and unemployment. The virus was often linked to co uh, climate change, and during Earth Day and World Environment Day observances, the call to continue on the path as an environmentally friendly nation was advocated. Several articles declared that addressing climate change is essential in stemming diseases. For more information, uh, please, you can see our full report, which will be in the Monteverdi Institute Digital Library. And this is just um, a code cloud, which shows the frequency of the terms that we coded in the news articles. So the bigger the bigger the word, the more often it was it was mentioned, and the smaller the word, the less it was mentioned. One of the major themes that we noticed in our research was the differences in um, emphasis between English and Spanish sources. Uh, this, is, this chart is um, an abbreviated version of our code frequencies chart. You can find the whole thing in our um, report. So something that is really interesting is, as you can see, COVID-19 is coded frequently throughout English and Spanish sources. But in the Tico Times, which is our English source, you can see that COVID-19 is coded most frequently along with um, health and the environment and national policy, whereas in the Spanish sources, um, climate change, health and the environment, and social ecological systems were coded most frequently. So what we can see is that the Tico Times emphasized COVID-19, while the Spanish sources emphasized COVID-19 and its relationship to the environment. Um, this is probably a result of the fact that these newspapers are targeted at different audiences. The Tico Times is targeted at expatriates while the Spanish sources are for um, Costa Ricans. So this is further supported by um, which environmental issues were present in the sources. In the Tico Times, most the most common environmental issue that was talked about was um, ecotourism and reopening. All of the reopening articles discussed the use of natural spaces, including national parks and beaches. So when it comes to um, environmental issues, that's what the expatriates care about. Whereas the um, Spanish articles were emphasizing um, climate change. Something else that is important within this research is the um, Animal Rehabilitation Code, which was only seen in the Tico Times. This is a result of their um, Slothy Sundays column. So every Sunday they post an article about sloths um, in conjunction with the Toucan Rescue Ranch, which is an animal rehabilitation center. So that's why we see all of the codes for animal rehabilitation. The reopening articles also frequently quoted um, environmental agencies. So between the animal rehabilitation and the reopening codes, we get a large amount of environmental organization codes that we don't see in the Spanish sources. Ecological systems were the most frequently occurring theme in the Costa Rican media, 82 times. Um, it's not surprising that ecological issues are still prevalent. Costa Rica is a global leader in conservation and sustainability. Um, but climate change was not mentioned often, um, 20 times. However, since Costa Rica is revered for advances in sustainability, such as its focus on renewable energy, it is surprising that climate change only emerged as a theme in a limited number of sources. This fits with the broader literature in that it shows that climate change issues have not been a focus of the media since COVID-19 began. Uh, the health and environment in COVID-19 were co-coded together quite often uh, and various environmental factors influenced the outbreak and spread of epidemics, which in turn caused feedback on the environment. So links between COVID and health of the planet was supported by the broader literature. Um, and then policy and politics also had a lot of code co-occurrences together. Um, although there was less agreement in the broader literature regarding policy as restrictions 
were the main focus um, in the newspaper. And in the Costa Rica media, policy is seemed to be a means by which the environment is protected and managed, and it's also um, how politicians can be held accountable for their actions. So while the immediacy of COVID-19 overshadows the sense of urgency to confront climate change, Costa Rican news reflects an understanding of the relationship between them. So in conclusion, um, the environment remains a significant concern for Costa Ricans even during the pandemic. This is a departure from our general literature, which says that the environment is being swept under the rug and really overshadowed by coronavirus. This supports the idea that Costa Rica is a world leader in sustainable development and environmental issues. It also underscores um, the politics and economic factors that are inextricably tied with environmental issues. The media is a really important influencer of public opinion, so it's extremely important that environmental news stays in the headlines so people continue to be aware about these issues and know that they're present and work to change them both right now and in the future. Thank you guys for listening and a big thank you to the Monteverde Institute and Dr. Allison Cantor for helping guide us on this journey. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Fascinating. Um, we can take uh, some time now for questions if uh, there is the option to use um, to raise your hand if you want to use that, or uh, we can just go for it. <laughs> um, like I said, this is my first Zoom symposium I'm hosting. Uh, does anyone Should have I a question? The... Should yes. I stop the screen share? Um, sure. I think I think it's stopped. Well, it says I'm still seeing your screen, but I'm seeing you. So yeah, if you want to go ahead and stop it, um, and then as anyone else speaks, we can see them. Great. Um, so are there any questions for uh, our presenters, Caitlin and Patricia. Yeah, I have a question. This is Richard Lalal. Um, now, I know you were only looking at newspapers in terms of, of media, so you don't have data on any other media. I would be curious if you have any impression at all how the newspaper uh, results might compare with TV news, for example, in Costa Rica. Yeah, that's definitely a really interesting um, idea. We and we unfortunately didn't look at any TV sources, so I I don't quite know um, how to answer your question. But I do think we would probably see a lot of similarities between what we saw in the newspapers and what we saw on TV. Um, there might be more um, emphasis on COVID-19 in the um, on TV because um, I know people watch TV for shorter periods of time and they just want to hear like quick snapshots of what's going on and COVID-19 has been a really big deal but that's based off of what I have been noticing in America which may be different from Costa Rica so I don't really know. I don't have anything to add. What I've noticed, by the way, I really don't watch Costa Rican news a lot, but um, I do check the uh, news channels on, on the internet, and uh, I've seen not much on environmental issues, at least in all the headlines they show daily. Uh, much of it is related to COVID-19 and, well, and murders and, and all that sort of thing, unfortunately. I have a question, or maybe it's um, an idea for a future project. Uh, did you, and I'm sorry if you mentioned this and I missed it, but did you come across anything about um, any links between uh, intact environments and access to nature and the mental health response to the pandemic? Speaking from my own experience, I can say um, I believe it's been incredibly important for myself in all of this, and I feel very fortunate to live in a place where I can go out my door and be in the forest. Um, and I've said so many times, I can't imagine how different this experience would have been if I were in the city in a tiny apartment and couldn't get out into nature. Um, so I wonder if you have any comments on that. 
Yeah, it's actually, um, that is something we did notice, especially um, in the Tico Times, um, in the Slothy Sunday articles that I mentioned, a lot of those articles did kind of mention that like maybe the news doesn't always show the positive things that are going on in the world. So like today we're going to take some time to like post pictures of cute sloths and like maybe this will help people re relax. So that actually is a theme that we did see, especially in those Slothy Sunday articles. Yeah, and there was just a general, um, it was pretty generalized about the mental health. We did have some of that in the literature that we looked at where they specifically talked about uh, mental health issues during COVID, but in the news in Costa Rica, um, in the Spanish sources that I looked at, it wasn't super top of, of mind. It was a lot of those environmental things were about we need to pay attention to the earth and we need to take care of it. And, you know, we can't, you know, slack off. We need to fight climate change. You know, there was a lot of, of that kind of, um, and, and, and there was also a lot about the health system in general. And, and uh, it seemed fairly positive, which is not the case in the United States. Um, but in Costa Rica, there was a fairly positive, um, you know, outlook on your health system. Okay, any other questions um, for Patricia or Caitlin before we move on? Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Sorry, Fern, it took, took me a little while here. That's okay, go ahead, Lauren. <laughs> so is there anything that you guys would have done differently or more of if you had more time? to work on this project? I think if we had more time, one of the things that we would have liked to work on, and we talked about this, was going back and looking at um, what was being published in the newspapers at this time, like last year before coronavirus, to see if there's been a change in the amount of environmental right. headlines we're seeing now versus in the past. So I think that's a big thing for me that I would have liked to look at. Yeah, Got you. yeah I agree. That was, that was the thing that, that we had on our agenda, but never really got to. And then um, we also had a second research question, which had to do with um, um, the economy and the environment in the time of COVID, but we also didn't have time for that. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you so much. Um, all right, well, let's move on. Then our next presenter is Kai Miller, um, who also worked with Allison Cantor um, on a longer internship. And uh, she is going to present uh, qualitative analysis, community-based research, and COVID-19. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Kai, uh, and my presentation, uh, the slides are in Spanish, but I will be presenting in English. Uh, and I have some notes right here, so I'll just go ahead and start and share my screen. All right. Okay. Ooh. Okay, can everybody see my screen right now? Great. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, my name is Kai Miller and I am an undergraduate thesis student at New College of Florida, uh, which is in Sarasota, Florida in the United States. Um, and I'm studying anthropology and environmental studies and I'm really interested in um, equitable conservation and sustainable development. Um, so the purpose of this presentation is to contextualize the application of qualitative uh, methods and analysis to community-based research in the results of the 12-week research internship that I, um, that I did in collaboration with Dr. Allison Cantor and the Monteverde Institute. So a community-based approach is especially important in the context of applied research to address some of the challenges that have arisen uh, in communities across the globe as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, such as food insecurity and unemployment. And throughout my internship, I explored the growing importance of community-based research uh, during the global public health crisis to inform future work in the Monteverde community and to also inform uh, regional environmental and uh, emergency policies during the pandemic. 
qualitative methods and analysis can, uh, they're, they're really useful because they can increase knowledge and understanding of an issue in order to integrate research findings in some of these recommendations um, and really as a method to create social change to benefit community members during a time of crisis. So what are the tenets of uh, community-based uh, research? It attempts to integrate all of the principles that we see here, but these each occur to varying degrees uh, during the research process. Um, so the first principle is to recognize a community as a unit of identity and to try to strengthen a sense of community through collective engagement and partnership with um, individuals participating in the research. Community-based research also attempts to build on strengths and resources that are pre-existing within, within a community, such as local government entities or community organizations um, and things like that. It also attempts to facilitate collaborative partnerships uh, and to treat research partners as uh, equals um, and to build upon knowledge that is pre-existing in research partners um, and mutually benefit each of the partners as well. Um, it also attempts to attend to social inequalities through some of the findings that may come out of the research process in order to uh, be attentive to community needs. And lastly, uh, community-based research disseminates findings and knowledge gain to all of the research partners through presentations, reports, infographics, other things, just like we are doing. So. So because of the COVID-19 emergency in Monteverde, um, we chose to pursue a community-based approach uh, to produce relevant and usable research outcomes uh, to address the needs of the District of Monteverde as the social, socioeconomic effects of the pandemic, uh, like food insecurity, et cetera, uh, grew over the months uh, of the research process. So multiple organizations formed throughout the early months of the pandemic as it went on. Uh, and they formed to address some of these issues at the municipal level and at the community level. Uh, and, and two of these organizations include um, the Subcomisión de Estadística y Censos, which in English is the uh, Statistics and Census Subcommission, and the Comisión de Enlace, which is the Liaison Commission. Both of these were really integral in the emergency response. So what are both of these subcommissions uh, and how do they apply to our research? So, the Comisión de Enlace, or the Liaison Commission, coordinated the activities of multiple subcommissions that emerged um, to address various emergency needs throughout the pandemic. Um, and the Statistics and, sub, uh, and Census Subcommission were formed to um, support the Liaison Commission through the collection uh, and analysis of data surrounding socioeconomic factors affecting the local population in the context of the COVID-19 emergency. The subcommission also worked to identify the needs of vulnerable groups that were affected by COVID-19 and provide information to local government in order to uh, guide local policy during the pandemic. And it was really a privilege to be able to work with the uh, Liaison Commission and the Statistics and Census Subcommission in order to support their work through community-based research throughout the pandemic. Um, so here are some of the methods and analysis that uh, Dr. Cantor and I used. Um, Essentially, um, we used qualitative analysis and research um, in order to support the subcommissions, the uh, Commission de, the Commission de Enlace and the um, Statistics and Census Subcommission throughout their response uh, by analyzing uh, 1,023 responses to the open-ended question, how has COVID-19 affected your household or family in the survey of households, which is the Encuesta de Hogares uh, that was disseminated in the early months of the pandemic by um, the Comisión de Enlace. And throughout this period, we used uh, qualitative research as a whole, which uh, integrates the techniques of observing, documenting, analyzing, and interpreting um, characteristics, attributes, and meanings of certain phenomena under study in order to more deeply understand a research situation. Um, and some methods that this includes um, include the survey, as I just mentioned, which the um, subcommission disseminated, as well as observation and community-based participation. So community-based participation happened in this context kind of virtually through attending meetings uh, and contributing to the work of each of these subcommissions. 
we also used qualitative analysis uh, to analyze the information that came out of uh, these methods and the responses to the survey um, in order to understand um, what what the kind of organic responses coming from the community were and what the real um, community needs were. And we used coding, uh, which was described by um, by Caitlin and Patricia in uh, the mixed method software deduce in order to do this. Um, just to give another sort of quick overview of that, what the true purpose of coding really is, is to identify defining concepts and find relationships between things that emerge from the basis of the data. Um, and through data driven coding, which was the method that we used, uh, we we're able to look for themes or concepts that allow the data to kind of speak for itself and uh, highlight the issues that are really important to the survey participants who responded. Uh, we also used inter-rater reliability um, to validate the efficacy of these codes. As for the codes themselves, we created 54 codes that were based on the data uh, that um, in the response to the open question. And um, some of these included uh, mentioned with mental health concerns such as anxiety or depression, food insecurity, reliance on family members, and lots of the, the pandemic. And we also used the technique of creating a code cloud in order to highlight which of the responses uh, were most common. So for example, we see that the majority are economic, such as through reduction of income and work, unemployment, uh, but mental health concerns and familial concerns also came up often. Um, so in terms of the results uh, that came out of this survey and that have continued to contribute to policy in the area, uh, we were able to identify some vulnerable groups uh, through this analysis. And the most vulnerable groups identified were those suffering from food insecurity, elderly adults, individuals with special needs, and minors. Uh, and these groups were previously not identified by the subcommission uh, or the Commission de Enlace, meaning that this analysis contributed um, novel information that maybe otherwise would not have um, come out of some of, um, some of these responses. So as I mentioned, the greatest effects of the COVID-19 pandemic were reduction of income, unemployment, and mental health. Um, qualitative analysis of the open-ended survey uh, and the open-ended question in the survey of households ultimately contributed to a report titled Results of the Survey of Households, Impacts of COVID-19 in the District of Monteverde. And this report was presented to the Comisión de Enlace and the Municipal Emergency Commission uh, in order to inform policymaking uh, and um, really shape the emergency response to the pandemic by providing this raw, uh, well, this qualitative data that was, um, that came out of community responses organically and really highlighted what the true community needs were through the voices of people that responded. Um, and this can also help to inform future community and municipal responses to unexpected emergencies. Some of the recommendations that this, um, that this, that these <laughs> results on this um, report are able to inform and make were, um, I'll just list a couple of these. A couple of them included offering training, such as financial education, to help people that were dealing with um, high costs but not being able to pay other um, pay their bills and other things like that. Uh, expand access to um, personal protective equipment and expand access for local food production. And that's really interesting because, as many of you know, many community organizations and initiatives have arisen throughout the pandemic um, to address food related issues. So this data can also inform those. And through these policy recommendations, the research and the findings that come out of the research can really feed back into community needs uh, and inform future responses. So as we all know, the global COVID-19 pandemic continues uh, and will continue to threaten livelihoods at a social, economic, and environmental level. And this is why um, community-based research is extremely important during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, research needs to be engaged, it needs to be applicable and relevant to community needs, and it can't be something that is extractive necessarily and just providing knowledge for knowledge's sake. 
Um, and by taking a community-based approach, Dr. Cantor and I were, were able to collaborate with people with diverse knowledge, skills, and expertise in order to assess the effects of COVID-19 on households and families and contribute to the emergency response throughout the course of the research. Um, um, so on the topic of benefiting communities beyond uh, a period of, of research, some of the things that can come out of this out of qualitative methods and analysis and applied community-based research include identifying vulnerable populations, supporting community initiatives and government agencies, supporting data sharing across communities, uh, and providing the data to inform uh, responses to future challenges, and this can include natural disasters, future pandemics, and climate change, which each of us have seen um, is a real challenge for the Monterey zone and for communities across Costa Rica and the globe. So I will be applying um, some, of the, some of the methods and, and analytical skills that I learned throughout the 12 week course of this internship to future work with the Monteverde Institute um, to, co to contribute and collaborate to community responses. But uh, in this case, I will be um, applying community-based qualitative research methodologies to assess how the pandemic has affected the operations of reserves in the area, such as the Bosque de Arno de los Niños and the Monteverde Cloud Forest Reserve, uh, as well as the extent of conservation organizations' uh, involvement with surrounding communities and how community needs have been addressed throughout the pandemic. Uh, I will also assess how communities economically dependent on ecotourism perceive its value as a conservation strategy on a basis in order to uh, shape the response to COVID-19 and broader environmental governance in a post-COVID-19 world. Um, yes, <laughs> these are my references having to do with community-based uh, participation and engagement. And thank you so much. Um, if you would like to find any other information about community-engaged research and qualitative methods and analysis, it can be found in my report by the same name, uh, qualitative analysis, community-based research, and COVID-19 in the um, Monteverde Institute digital collections. Thank you so much. If anybody has questions or comments, please let me know, and I'll be very happy to answer them. Thank you, Kai. Uh, all right, we can open it up for questions for Kai. Ask you to go back to your recommendation slide. Absolutely. I, thank you. Oh, I'm still sharing my screen. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. It was an excellent presentation. Um, I wanted to go back to this because, as you know, we're really concerned about how we can help. So. I to very much appreciate that you went through all of this analysis and then have put this slide on here. So I'm just going to take a minute to go through it. Yeah. And um, Deb, I'd also like to mention that these recommendations um, actually came directly out of the entire report for the um, Encuesta de Hogares um, that I took the lead on for the subcommission, the statistics and census subcommission. So um, while a lot of the analysis that Kai and I worked on the qualitative piece, there's also an entire quantitative piece that we um, presented to the municipality um, and the report is publicly available. So we can definitely pass that along. I think some of you, I know Fern, you've um, been able to take a look at that report. And so all of these recommendations came out of of that big analysis that we did with the Comisión de Enlace. Yeah. And that's something that I would have liked to explore more if, like, through, if, I, if I had had more time uh, learning some of the more qualitative skills because I, I learned so much and it's been so beneficial to learn these qualitative analytical skills, but uh, quantitative analysis is kind of a weak point of mine. So that's something that I definitely wanna pursue in the future, maybe throughout my collegiate uh, studies in the next year in statistics. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, um, I, I typed something, but I guess I don't have uh, the way to make it work. Um, you know, this is really fascinating to me, but how in the world did you do this as a virtual um, internship? 
You know, that's the great part because a lot of these methods um, and, and qualitative analysis actually really lend themselves to a virtual research approach. So um, one thing that I wrote about more in my report, which is in the MVI digital collections, is how virtual uh, community-based research um, is very important because it inherently relies on collaboration with community members. And because of the virtual nature of the research, that collaboration is unavoidable. Um, and it's actually really beneficial to collaborate with local community organizations for yourself, but also in um, achieving the tenets of community-based research by giving back to the community, um, making the research applied and relevant. Um, so that's one part of that. But with uh, qualitative analysis, the software deduce uh, is collaborative software. So Dr. Cantor and I were able to remotely collaborate in the application in order to analyze all of the 1,023 results to the open-ended question. Uh, and we were able to use Google Docs uh, and, and other collaborative software in order to uh, analyze these data and, and work that out. So it works surprisingly well. It's, it's really fantastic. And I definitely would recommend it um, for future interns and for anybody interested in social research uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic or just from a distance because it's a very enriching experience. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Anything else? Hey, thank you, Kai. Great. All right, next um, we have Claire Gable, who uh, is going to be presenting part of her internship. Um, First, Claire and Margaret both worked with Deb Hamilton on uh, reforest, reforestation research. And then uh, they both wrapped it up with Louisa and Claire actually has a week left. Um, and Claire worked with Louisa on stream water quality in the Monteverde area. And she's gonna tell us more about that. So thank you, Claire. Yeah, all right, let me share my screen. All right, so so hello, thank you for being here. Um, my presentation is on stream water quality in the Monteverde area. Um, and I'm really excited to share what I worked on for the past five weeks with you. So first I'll tell you a little bit about myself. As I said, my name is Claire um, and I was a remote intern at Monteverde Institute this summer. Um, I'm entering my junior year at Mount Holyoke this fall where I'm an environmental studies major and a concentration in ecology. Um, I have not declared a minor yet, but I, as of now I'm planning on minoring in educational studies. So during my internship, I looked at data collected from multiple streams in the Monteverde area, um, but I've chosen four to share with you today. So not all of the streams I looked at had the same amount of data, so I chose the four with the most data collection samples. So the four I will be presenting today are Quebrada Colegio, Quebrada Quecha Fabrica, Quebrada La Saca, and Rio Negro. So first is Colegio. So Colegio is the smallest of the streams with width of just, um, just about a meter um, in some places and it is very shallow. So it is believed to have previously had the highest contamination um, of the floor due to pollution runoff and then proximity to a construction site which is just 500 meters away. Um, and Queche Fabrica is then um, the next stream, and <laughs> that is one of the two largest streams. So it spans six meters in some places and eight meters in other places. The next stream is um, La Saca, which is the second smallest and is only a few meters wide. Um, it carries just a little bit more water than Colegio, um, and Rio Negro is the last one, which is another large stream about the same width as Pecha Fabrica in some locations, 
um, Rio Negro is known to have some better conditions than some of the other streams in the Monte Verde area. So as I mentioned earlier, the purpose of this project was to examine the water quality of these streams. So this can be achieved using a couple different methods. So the first that I will um, speak to you about today is bioindicator. So a bioindicator is an organism that can tell us about the health of an ecosystem based on population numbers, behavior, or role in a community. So in this case, I reviewed data on macroinvertebrates. So although the word macroinvertebrate may sound a little bit long and complicated, it's actually quite simple. So an invertebrate is an organism that doesn't have a backbone, such as an insect or bug. And macro means it can be seen with the naked eye. So you don't need a microscope to see it. Um, so we can analyze the quality of a stream based on which macroinvertebrates are found in a stream. Um, and how many. So this is because macroinvertebrates have different tolerance levels to contamination. Um, so if a macroinvertebrate has low tolerance to contamination, then that means it would likely not survive in a stream with bad quality water um, and you'd be unlikely to find it there. Instead, a stream with um, lots of contamination would have more macroinvertebrates with low tolerance levels. Um, you'll the low tolerance macroinvertebrates tend to be really good competitors in their ideal conditions. So in this graphic, um, you, you can see you'd be more likely to find caddisflies, so those are my favorite, um, living in a clean stream and a flatworm in poor water quality. So to gather this data, various student groups collected macroinvertebrates at several sites using sieves and nets. Um, and then the data was collected throughout 2019, and then each of these streams data was collected um, in at least four different months. So once the macroinvertebrates have been collected, um, um, there are several indices that can be used to figure out what the raw data means for stream health. So I'll be talking about four in particular, and so those are the BE index, the BMWP index, the PMA index, and the Shannon index. So first I have the BE index. So this organizes macroinvertebrates by contamination tolerance level. So each family is assigned a score from one to nine. Um, the higher the score, the lower the, the lower the contamination. So this means that the families with the highest scores have the cleanest water and the families with the lowest scores will be in the most polluted streams. So the scores can then be organized into three categories indicating the quality of the water. So um, one to three is bad quality, which is the red. Four to six is regular quality, which is the green, and seven to nine is the good quality, which is the blue. And the BE index is pre-assigned, so no calculations are necessary. So here I've created four pie graphs, so one for each stream. Um, and these graphs show the BE index of the macroinvertebrates found at these streams within the entire year. So as you can see, each graph is divided into three sections with the good, the regular, and the bad. Um, and all the macroinvertebrates with a BE index score of one to three fall under the bad water quality category, four to six being regular, and seven to nine being bad quality. So these pie graphs are helpful because although they don't show every individual score, you can start to see which streams may be more contaminated. So Colegio has uh, a low number of um, good quality water macroinvertebrates um, and, a, and a higher number of families that are falling into the bad quality category. So this suggests that it may be more contaminated than the other streams. On the other hand, Lasaka has the highest number of good quality families with high BE scores and only one bad water quality family. So this suggests that the water quality is probably rather good. Um, and I'd say it's probably the best of the four. So next we have the BMWP 
index. CR just stands for Costa Rica because this index can be slightly different based on location. So the BE index number four can tell us more information about the contamination um, tolerance of the macroinvertebrates found there, but the BMWP index can more succinctly show the overall water quality. Um, and so this is a more useful index for generalizing water quality and comparing sites. So to calculate the BMW index, first add up all of the score of the BE scores found at a stream. Um, it doesn't matter how many individuals there are, as long as one individual in a family is present, the BE score of that family should be counted and should be added. Um, so after um, calculating the BMWP, you can use this chart to determine the quality of the water. So the higher the BMWP, the better the water quality. So this is the data for the four streams that I looked at. These BMWP values represent the mean of the whole year. So I determined BMWP for each sample, um, then found the mean. So as you can see, um, Colegio had the lowest BMP value. Um, meaning it had the worst water quality of the four streams. Um, Quecha Fabrica, um, Fabrica sorry, had the second worst water quality based on the index, and Lasaka and Rio Negro were fairly comparable. So this graph compares the 2018 mm -hmm. data to the 2019 data, which is what I reviewed. Um, Colegio and Quecha Fabrica both decreased from 2018 to 19, while La Saca and Rio Negro both increased. Um, the changes are slight and no stream moved into a new category, um, but it'd be interesting to look at the data for the coming years to assess whether the patterns continue or not. So in addition to the BMWP index, the PMA index can also be used to judge water quality. Differently from the BMWP, this index is based on the orders of macroinvertebrates rather than the, the families. Um, additionally, it is determined using proportions. So the PMA index is slightly more complicated to calculate, so I've included this little guide. So the first step is to calculate the percentage of macroinvertebrates in each order. So this is the total number in that order divided by the total number of macroinvertebrates. Um, there are several more orders than the five that are included in this index. So while doing the calculations, I found that I regular ha regularly had many in the others category. So then each order has a set um, model percentage. So I subtracted the percentages I calculated from the model numbers and converted all answers to positive numbers. Um, finally, I added up all the values for each order and then multiplied this value by one half or, and, multi and subtracted it from 100. Um, this index also contains a scale of its own where the higher the PMA, the higher the water quality. So from my calculations with these four streams, I found that the PMA index yielded very similar results to the BMWP index, with Colegio having the worst water quality and Masaka and Rio Negro having the two highest. Um, and you can see that the line represents the BMW index while um, the bars represent the PMA index. So the fourth and final index that I'm going to talk about is the Shannon index. The Shannon index describes the diversity of families at a stream. So diversity is important because a higher diversity typically indicates an ecosystem is healthy and more resilient. So to calculate the Shannon index, um, you first calculate the proportion of individuals in each family, then take the log of those values then multiply that product by the original proportions. And then finally, take the sum of those numbers and multiply it by negative one. So this graph shows the Shannon, the calculated Shannon index for each stream that I looked at. And as expected, Colegio has the lowest diversity. So the remaining streams are all relatively similar, with Lasaka being slightly more diverse than the others. 
Um, so these pie graphs show the proportions of the families found at each stream. I know these graphs don't provide much information at all, but I found them to be a helpful way to visualize diversity um, as well as richness, which is how many total families there are, and evenness, which is how um, even the proportions of the families are. So here you can see that Colegio has a lower evenness because it has um, a large proportion of one family. Um, and that leads to lower diversity and ultimately lower water quality. So now that I've discussed indices, I'm going to talk about parameters. So the parameters are another way that we can gauge the quality of stream water. So these measurements are collected using meters and special pieces of technology, as well as lab tests. So for this presentation, I'll be presenting on six main parameters. So first I'll talk about dissolved oxygen. So dissolved oxygen is just simply the amount of oxygen that you can find in the water. Dissolved oxygen is important because aquatic animals such as fish um, rely on that oxygen to survive and high dissolved oxygen indicates good water quality. So that this measurement is in um, milligrams per liter. And as you can see, Quecha Fabrica, La Sata, and Rio Negro all have similar levels. Um, and Colegio has the lowest amount of dissolved oxygen suggesting poor water quality. Next, I have conductivity. So high conductivity indicates poor water quality. Based on this graph, Colegio has the highest conductivity and worst water quality, which is as expected at this point. And Masaka has the lowest conductivity and highest water quality. Um, this graph shows the total dissolved solids in the water. So that can include any kind of pollution in the water. Um, so it's best if the value is lower. The, these values match the conductivity graph with Colegio having a very high amount of total dissolved solids. Next is pH. So the pH of water, which is pure neutral, um, is, is seven. So the closer to seven, the better. Um, anything higher means that the water is basic. Um, Colegio is the only stream with a much higher pH, although I didn't perform any statistical analyses to determine the significance. Turbidity is one way to conceptualize how clear the water is. So high turbidity means any particles in the water are suspended and not settled out at the bottom. Um, high turbidity can cause the water to look brown or murky. Um, and that is exactly what we see at Colegio. So the lower turbidi the turbidity, typically, um, the cleaner the water is going to be. So finally, I want to talk about flow. So while all the other graphs showed very similar patterns, um, flow does not. So in this case, flow was measured by timing how long it took for a ping pong ball to travel one meter downstream. And then this was converted to a speed, taking into consideration um, the width and depth of the stream to accurately represent a 3D channel of water. Um, Clayhio has a very low flow, which could have something to do with its quality if there are few species, a low diversity, and un a generally unhealthy ecosystem. Um, low moving water can collect pollution over time if there's not that much movement. But it also may mean that the stream is just small. Um, so if flow is a direct indicator of stream health, you'd expect to to see that Lasaka would have a high flow since all the parameters, other parameters suggest that Lasaka is the cleanest of the four streams that we've looked at. Um, so we can conclude that flow does not dictate water quality necessarily, but it's an interesting parameter to examine nonetheless um, because it can tell us a little bit about the size of the stream. So now I just have a couple takeaways. So first, Lasaka and Rio Negro had the highest um, BMWP and PMA indices, while Colegio had the lowest. Lasaka and Quecha Fabrica had the highest Shannon index and highest diversity. Colegio had the lowest. So the parameters repeatedly showed that water quality is poorest at Quebrada Colegio and best at Quebrada Lasaka. Um, and so this just means that Quebrada Colegio is likely the most polluted of the four streams. 
So um, that's all for my presentation, but I just wanted to say thank you to the people who have helped me throughout my internship this summer. So first, Luisa for helping me with this project and helping me analyze and understand all the data. It was absolutely wonderful working and learning from you. Um, then I want to thank Deborah for introducing me to Monteverde Institute at the beginning of my internship. Um, I loved, had a fantastic time learning about Equitea Monteverdensis with you. Um, thank you to Fern for organizing this symposium and then remote internship program. Um, I'm really appreciative of all the students who collected data out in the field. Um, I definitely wish I could be in Costa Rica right now collecting data as well, but I appreciate the work of everyone else who participated in this project. Um, and finally, all the rest of the Monteverde Institute staff. I appreciate the work you do. So thank you. And that's, that's it. Thank you, Claire. Um, Truly impressive, especially given this was just part of an internship. Uh, <laughs> so let's open this up to any questions for Claire. I found this fascinating and um, I've been following the, the Adopt a Stream program for a while that Louisa is in charge of. And I know uh, there have been other people, there have been other interns who have collected data over the years. Is that what your your basic um, pile of data came from, um, the, the previous collections under Luis's supervision and, and her predecessors? Yeah, it was all of my data was based off of previous data that had been collected. Um, I did a lot of like entering the data into a database so that I could go and analyze it. But yeah, it was mostly um, past student groups who have been able to go out and collect the data. Thank you. Claire, um, Claire you're a natural. <laughs> um, it's great to see all of this. That, that was really well done. One question is, I'm not sure where Lasaka is, and that might be a question for Louisa, because um, that's fascinating, the results. And probably, as Louisa has said, we've always been super concerned about the fabrica um, and the pollution there. So it's, it's a little bit uh, worrisome, but also very interesting to see your results. Um, I also know that Luis is really interested in looking at the streams now in 2020, given the pandemic and, and all of these presentations are running together very nicely. Um, and I think one, one request I would have is if out of all of the analyses that you did, if you would do a recommendation on what would be the really the key measures to look at, which one out of your three kind of bioindicator um, surveys which analysis there would be the most effective to repeat or to do again um, without having to do all three of them, which one of those three would be the best to do in order to compare the 2020 data to the 2019. Um, but very nicely done. It was fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, I noticed that the PMA index and the BMWP index had very similar results, particularly for the streams that I looked at. Um, for this presentation, but on all the other streams that I that I gathered the data from, um, they differed, and I'm not exactly sure why or which would be a better measure. Um, but I definitely like the BMWP index based on the analysis that um, it provided, and I I think that that would be a very interesting one to repeat. Um, but I also think that the Shannon index is important because it tells you more specifically about the ecosystem in general. And um, I guess, yeah, what, what the different families are and whether it's all spread out and whether it's really healthy and diverse or whether it seems to be struggling a little bit. I think it can be even just a good indicator of um, just the, what the life is like as opposed to just um, what the water quality is, which I think is an important general thing to consider. Let me add just uh, to the question to uh, where the SACA is. The SACA is in the Reserva de Santa Elena. It's also called uh, Quebrada Quetzal, but they changed the name. But yeah, it's in the, like in the center, in the heart of the uh, Reserva de Santa Elena. Also, another thing I would like to add is that um, 
the changes in different uh, sites depending on the sample size or the sample size affected a, a lot the results. So basically, um, some of the things that Claire saw with the other um, um, sites, I think some of, of the changes or different um, indices that she found and uh, not related, not related with the water quality is because of the sam uh, sampling size of the uh, the sample size of the of the um, the sites that we collected. Depending on the that varies a lot depending on how many students you have with you when you collect the samples and also uh, how many uh, times you can visit the the places. So, so that varies a lot depending on on the number of the students that we have. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, Claire, for uh, this work over the past few weeks. And thank you to Louisa for um, work over a much longer period with the adopt a stream program. Okay, let's um, move on then. Our next presentation uh, is uh, similar to Claire, is by Margaret Rindlisbacher, who also started working with Deb on some reforestation uh, research data analysis, and then has wrapped up her internship with Louisa on the subject of bird distribution in the Crandall Reserve, comparison between neotropical migrants and resident species. So take it away, Margaret. Thank you. Hola, buenos dias a todos. Um, voy a hacer mi presentación en español. Um, y comparto la pantalla, si funciona bien. Okay. Todos lo ven en pantalla grande, sí. Okay, perfecto. Um, pues, hola. Um, esta presentación se llama distribución de aves en la reserva Candel y comparamos um, los especies residentes con los especies migratorias. Um, Primero quiero presentarme, me llamo Marguerite Rindlisbacher y estudio geología en Mount Holyoke College. Um, aquí tengo algunas fotos de mi universidad, que también es la universidad de los otros estudiantes que ya han presentado. Y he trabajado con Luisa en este proyecto. Um, este proyecto um, trata del programa el monitoreo de sobrevivencia invernal, que también se llama MOSI, y fue establecido en 2002 con el Instituto Poblacional de Aves y consiste en una red de estaciones de monitoreo de pájaros en las Américas y voluntarios trabajan en estas estaciones para capturar los aves y anillarlos y tomar datos sobre su salud, su especie, su edad, entre otros. Y um, el Instituto Monteverde ha trabajado con el Instituto Poblacional de Aves para coleccionar um, los datos con los cuales trabajo hoy. Y esta foto muestra um, un pájaro con, capturado con su anillo en color indicando um, qué usamos para um, tomar los datos y, uh, y sí. Um, quiero clarificar que uh, la diferencia entre aves residentes y aves migratorias. Aves residentes viven en la misma zona todo el año, mientras que aves migratorias viajan a otro sitio para su temporada de reproducción. Y en específico, um, con este proyecto uh, analizamos aves migratorias neotropicales que viven en América Central y América del Sur pero pasan su temporada de reproducción en América del Norte, así que viajan largas distancias durante el año. Y um, los científicos han visto que las poblaciones de aves migratorias neotropicales disminuyen en número en años recientes debido a cambios climáticos y otros factores como la deforestación, deforestación que destruye um, los 
ambientes de reproducción que contribuyen a la salud y la sobrevivencia de una población. Um, aquí los métodos usados en este proyecto um, son de tener um, 12 estaciones de redes de malla fina, también llamadas redes de niebla, en la Reserva Candel y en esta foto um, se ve la red um, y el mapa aquí muestra la distribución de las redes en la Reserva Candel y um, son uh, puestos en secciones diferentes de la reserva. En, la, en el verde clara um, indica el bosque rehabilitado um, y en el verde que es más un tono medio es el bosque secundario y el verde oscuro es el bosque primario. Así que son en ambientes diferentes. Y um, también es importante mencionar los límites de estas redes que solo son de una altura especificada que hay pájaros que vuelan en um, alturas más altas del bosque. Así que estas redes solo capturan las aves que vuelan entre estes, estas alturas de más o menos entre cuatro metros, algo así. Así que hay limitaciones. Um, los resultados de los datos son um, usando entre 13 y 14 redes total a uh, los investigadores, que no fue yo, no estaba en el campo, um, pero capturaron 191 aves entre las temporadas de noviembre de 2019 y marzo de 2020 y con un total de 1,075 uh, horas red um, y este total de pájaros capturados resulta en una tasa de captura que es la proporción de aves comparado con las horas red um, de um, 17 porcentaje. Y esta foto muestra un pájaro capturado en la red para um, mostrar cómo los investigadores capturan los pájaros para poder tomar sus datos. Y lo que hemos visto es que en este gráfico que muestra la tasa de captura en porcentaje por especie comparando los pájaros residentes y los pájaros migratorios, muestra que uh, los pájaros residentes um, son más comunes y también uh, y en comparación que los migratorios um, son menos comunes en esta reserva. Um, y también que hay una alta tasa de captura específicamente en el pájaro OSTF, que es el Olive Stripe Flycatcher, en los pájaros residentes y una alta tasa de captura aquí en los pájaros migratorios con el SWCH, que es el um, Swainson Thrush. Y este gráfico aquí uh, muestra la tasa de captura por especie por solo los residentes comparando en azul la temporada de noviembre de 2019 y en rojo la temporada de marzo de 2020. Y se nota que la alta tasa de captura del um, Olive Strike Flycatcher, que aparece aquí en esta foto, um, ocurre por la mayoría en marzo, pero también hay una alta tasa de captura um, del Olive Strike Flycatcher en noviembre. Y aquí hacemos lo mismo con los pájaros um, migratorios. Y aquí se nota que la alta tasa de captura del Swainson's Thrush ocurre por la mayoría en noviembre de 2019. Um, aquí, que está aquí en azul. Y también hay uh, una foto del pájaro del Swainson's Thrush. Y pues después de hacer este resumen de los datos de solo um, este año más reciente, también 
comparamos los datos con años anteriores de tendencias. Y hemos visto um, en este gráfico que muestra la tasa de captura en porcentaje por cada año, comparando en azul um, todos los pájaros capturados versus en um, naranja solo los residentes y en gris solo los migratorios. Um, muestra por lo general que la tasa de captura aumenta um, empezando en 2018 y 2019. Y, Sí, se nota este um, aumento en los residentes y en los migratorios también. Y este gráfico muestra la cantidad de especies, así que el número de especies, solo no el número de pájaros, um, eh, comparando los migratorios y los residentes um, por temporada. Y más o menos el número de especies se mantiene a pesar del aumento en tasa de captura, que indica que no es que hay más mm, diversidad en las especies, es que captura más pájaros en años recientes. Y también es importante indicar que hubo menos redes usadas en marzo de 2017, que sería aquí en esta parte donde hay una reducción de número de especies, um, solo porque um, hubo solo un día de captura en vez de um, cinco días uh, de captura como en otros años y reduce el número de capturas en total. Pero um, no hay un aumento significativo en cuanto a número o reducción en cuanto al número de especies aquí. Um, pues pasamos a analizar solo el Swainson's Thrush, el pájaro migratorio, y um, queda claro que hay un aumento en tasa de captura empezando en 2018 y 2019, como ya hemos visto, visto en otros gráficos. Um, y este pájaro, eh, debido al número muy grande de um, capturas, explica el aumento en tasa de captura en los migratorios. Pero en años recientes, en uh, 2018 y 2019, los datos fueron tomados en la primera semana de noviembre en vez de en otro, otros años cuando fueron tomados en la tercera o la cuarta semana de noviembre. Y al principio de noviembre es el tiempo en que esta especie, el Swings and Thrush, um, pasa por la reserva Candle con más frecuencia porque es su tiempo de migración um, entre su zona de reproducción y sus otras zonas. Así que este puede explicar el aumento de capturas aquí. Um, con el Olive Stripe Flycatcher, el pájaro residente, hay una tendencia general de aumentar la tasa de captura, pero también hay una reducción en tasa en 2018 y 2019. Um, y por eso no podemos decir que el Olive Stripe Flycatcher únicamente explica el aumento general de tasa de captura en los pájaros residentes. Así que tiene que ver con otros factores también que todavía no sabemos y, um, y queda otra pregunta para otros proyectos de investigación. Um, y aquí uh, analizamos la tasa de captura por gremio. Y el gremio de un pájaro es el tipo de um, comida de alimentación que come el pájaro. Así que F significa frutívoro, que sería un pájaro que solo come frutos. Y um, con la letra I indica que es un insectívoro, um, que son los pájaros que solo comen insectos. Y si tiene una combinación como F, N, I, sería un pájaro que es por la mayoría un frutívoro, pero también come néctar, que es un nectívoro, y insectos. Um, y en este gráfico uh, muestra que hay una reducción en tasa de captura Um, por los insectívoros, que es la línea amarilla, y um, un aumento en tasa de captura por los frutívoros insectívoros, que
que es el color um, rojo, naranja, más oscuro. Um, esta línea aquí, no sé si se ve mi ratón. Um, pero este aumento en tasa de captura por los frutívoros um, insectívoros uh, es uh, debido a la tasa, el aumento en tasa de captura por el Swinson's Thrush, que es un frutívoro insectívoro. Um, y pensamos eh, que la reducción en tasa de captura de los insectívoros es debido a la um, reducción um, de insectos observado globalmente por el uso de pesticidas. Um, y es que eh, la um, proporción, eh, la población de un pájaro basado en el gremio varía con la disponibil disponibilidad del alimento. Así que, pero, Seguimos um, investigando este. Pues en conclusión, hemos visto que la mayoría de los pájaros capturados en eh, la Reserva Crandall en 2010, eh, 2019 y 2020 son pájaros residentes de la zona. Um, pero eh, hemos visto una alta tasa de captura en los pájaros migratorios, um, específicamente el Swainson's Thrush y una alta tasa de captura en los pájaros residentes, específicamente con el Olive Stripe Flycatcher. Y um, comparado con otros años, la, el total tasa de captura aumenta empezando en 2018 y 2019 y la tasa de captura de insectívoros baja empezando en 2018 y 2019. Y todavía hay mucho trabajo que hacer y um, no hemos hecho estadísticas, pero supongo que otros estudiantes o otros investigadores pueden seguir con estos datos y seguir um, con otros años tomando datos para comparar y aumentar um, la información que tenemos en cuanto a este proyecto. Y eh, en final quiero decir gracias, dar gracias a Luisa por trabajar conmigo con este proyecto y por apoyarme con todo eso. Fue muy divertido y muy interesante trabajar con estos datos. Y también quiero dar gracias a Deborah Hamilton y Fern Perkins y todo el Instituto de Monteverde por la oportunidad de hacer esta pasantía y por organizarla y por hacerlo en una manera tan um, divertida e interesante, aunque es solo virtual y no podemos estar Um, en cito. Y también muchísimas gracias al público por su tiempo y por su atención en esta presentación. Um, y si tiene alguna pregunta, uh, estoy disponible. Muchas gracias, Margaret. Uh, preguntas or questions for Margaret. And thank you for your presentation in Spanish. We can have questions uh, in either language. And if anyone would like to ask a question in Spanish to any of the participants who aren't fluent, I'm happy to translate as well. So we can open it up for questions to Margaret and, uh, and then we'll see if there are any closing comments. Gracias, Margaret. Yo tengo miles de preguntas, pero no voy a... <laughs> atrasar todo, todo el mundo, pero muchísimas gracias por hacer esto porque los patrones siempre abren más preguntas y yo no sé si Carlos Guinden está todavía, pero hemos hablado sobre Olive Stripe Flycatcher y Luisa también de qué está pasando con esta ave. Quería agregar una cosa. Luisa y yo hemos trabajado en un estudio sobre cambios de comunidades de aves por los últimos 40 años. El patrón que usted está enseñando allá es igual que estamos encontrando, que los, las aves que son solamente insectívoros están en declinación, pero los otros que tienen una mezcla de dieta que incluye insectos están aumentando. Y es muy interesante que usted tiene este patrón, aunque es debido a los 
los las captores de Swainson Strush y Olive Stripe Flycatcher. Pero muy interesante como usted está presentándolo y, y como en, en todos los estudios cuando hay una presentación de una forma de datos, siempre hay miles de preguntas, pero muchísimas gracias por todo este análisis y, y no sé si Carlos está para dar comentarios. Ah, sí, aquí estoy todavía. Eh, excelente presentación. Y igual me, me interesa mucho ese patrón de cambio con el Olive Striped. Se me ocurre que algo importante hacia el futuro, si fuera posible, sería eh, estar colectando datos eh, a la misma vez sobre eh, fenol fenológicos en cuanto a fructificación y floración y una medida de presencia de insectos que se pudiera ir eh, colectando la misma vez cada año y daría posiblemente capacidad para empezar a contestar algunas de las preguntas en cuanto a, a patrones. Pero sí, muy interesante y, y impresionante lo que han hecho los estudiantes eh, a pesar de tener que hacerlo virtualmente. Eh, felicitaciones a todos. Gracias. Um, veo que hay un comentario en el chat um, hecho por Federico. Um, eh, dice, puede mencionar ejemplos de especies muy raras o poco comunes. Y me encantaría, pero realmente uh, um, estudio geología y no sé muchísimo de la biología. Um, y eh, estas cuatro semanas son mi... Mi primera vez trabajando con pájaros, así que no les conozco muy bien, pero si alguien diferente lo sepa, um, uh, sería muy interesante saber también. Yo voy a... Gracias, Margaret. Realmente impresionada con su trabajo porque usted no... Um, no tiene el background de, de biología como tiene como tenía Claire, por lo menos, que también hizo un impresionante trabajo. Eh, para especies como raras, eh, hemos encontrado, lo último que encontré es un flycatcher que normalmente es del, del, del Caribe. Este, tengo que buscar el nombre, pero no me acuerdo ni el nombre en inglés ni en español, pero es el Fulficauda, es el, el nombre científico. Este, algo rump Flycatcher, Debbie, auxilio. <ríe> no me sé el nombre. Este, esa es una de las especies así como raras que apareció eh, esporádicamente este marzo. Pero también en el 2018, 2019, aparecieron varias especies de migratorias que normalmente no encontrábamos, como el Summer eh, Tanager o el, hay un cucu también migratorio que apareció. Eh, Voy a poner el video. Entonces, eh, eh, aumentó un poquito el, el número de especies, solo como dos o tres diferentes. Eh, pero realmente otra, otra cosa que está apareciendo es eh, algún catarus, eh, que son sorsales, eh, los eh, eh, nightingale thrushes, que llaman. Esos también este, hay, han, han estado... Aparece uno raramente como el Sladyback Nightingale Thrush. Ese apareció una sola vez, pero eh, ha habido varias especies que son con números pequeños, pero eso es como lo normal cuando uno trabaja en un bosque, ¿verdad? Que tiene especies que son eh, poco abundantes y, y que uno puede llamar raras, pero la verdad es que lo que impresiona es el aumento en el número del de Olive Stripe eh, Flycatcher. Eh, yo, para decirle un poquito a Carlos, yo tengo colectadas heces de los, de los pájaros que cuando tengo tiempo, ¿verdad? Y no hay tantos, colecto las heces eh, de las bolsas donde están y tengo de, de ese año, eh, de ese aumento, eh, bastantes muestras y lo que parece que estaban comiendo esa vez es una especie que era caprifoliase y ya le cambiaron el, el, la familia, pero es de Viburnium. Estaba en, en fructificación y no sé si es esa es la razón por la cual eh, habían tantos ahí, era porque estaba fructificando esa especie en ese momento. Entonces, eh, 
puede ser la razón por la que haya tantos en ese momento en, el, en la Reserva Crandel, pero hay que continuar, como siempre, muchos años de estudio para, para poder tener patrones, como lo dijo Claire. Hey, Margaret, sorry. Es, uh, voy a decir esta, pero es, no es una pregunta, pero nada más para decir muchas gracias a Luisa por seguir con todos esos estudios y también de Adopte Quebrada porque son, es una recolecta de datos muy importantes y, y Luisa lo hace como un rock. Um, y también a Allison por todos los estudios también con Caitlin y Kai y Patricia. Um, y perdón, Patricia y Caitlin, en el principio, en vez de poner aplauso, yo puse un thumbs up nada más para decirle que esa es mi parte de conocimiento con Zoom. <risa> um, porque todas las presentaciones eran excelentes. Entonces, nada más quería decir gracias a todos y también a Alison y Luisa. Um, I just like to add, I, I think this was terrific by all of the presentations. Uh, with all of the presentations, and I am amazed what we were able to do with the virtual internships. I, I had no idea before this. Now, my next point is, how are you going to publicize this so that other people um, can uh, do virtual in internships? Um, you know, something on the web page, some stuff on Facebook, and um, other other locations to publicize uh, the possibilities and, you know, give some examples of, of how successful people have been in internships. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you for being here as part of the audience. And thank you for uh, so many other ways in which you support the Institute, which I could never um, begin to list right here. Uh, so I was actually going to, thank you for the seg there. I was going to show um, how to get to, I put a link earlier in the chat, um, but I wanted to show everyone just how you get to, uh, okay, so this is the Monteverde Institute main page, monteverde-institute.org. And if you go here to library and then MVI digital collections, um, this is where our digital collections are housed. And so all of the interns and research affiliates uh, submit a final product um, to be housed in these collections. And in this process, I would like to thank Lori Kuttner who's, um, for being part of the audience today and also for all of the support of our library. Um, and then I also wanted to show under Get Involved, um, we have our traditional internship opportunities. And then here we have um, information about the virtual internships. And right here you can see a catalog. Um, so that's on our website. And uh, let's see. I will also thank Marco in the process um, for helping to publicize information like that from the Institute, which we're going to be working more on getting the word out there. Um, I would like to thank, uh, again, Lori and other folks who are here who have spread the word about the internships. So um, anyone who has put the word out there, we thank you very much. Um, so yeah, more to come. We're in uncharted territory here of uh, the virtual offering. And I would like to offer a heartfelt thanks um, to the, all of the interns and the supervisors, um, Deborah Hamilton, uh, Luisa Moreno, Alison Cantor and uh, Marco Crawford is also going to be working with Claire, I understand, for the week that remains in her internship. Um, I'm really just blown away uh, by the quality and the depth of, of these presentations. Um, and I thank you all so much for this work uh, on these different projects, but also for being the pioneers in our um, virtual internship program. I really um, am just, so happy with the result. I didn't really know what to expect. This is new for all of us. Um, so thank you all so much. Uh, it's been wonderful. And if there are uh, any general questions or comments um, uh, or any more questions for any of the presenters or supervisors, uh, we can take those now. Well, I just, I have a comment, Fern. Um, I, I just want to thank the the interns and the staff for working together to 
do studies in which which are data driven, which use adequate statistics, and which make information results uh, available for community use and hopefully uh, in in some cases for use right now during this pandemic. So thank all of you very much. I have a question for all the interns. Um, I'm wondering through this virtual internship experience, how you actually learned about the context of the place um, in which you were working without being there. Um, I can speak for a minute. Um, the orientation that I received from the Monteverde Institute uh, by Selena Avendano uh, was really um, helpful. And also uh, we had some presentations and workshops. We had one from Deborah. We had a couple of um, other um, people involved in the Monteverde community. And so um, we were given these presentations where um, we were able to, to learn about the, um, about the work and about the place. So, um, you know, it's not as good as being there, definitely, but it gave me a really good picture of what was going on in Costa Rica and especially in the Monteverde Institute. Thank you. Sounds like a class act to me. And I will add um, something to that. Some of the interns, um, I guess one lesson I think I've taken away from this uh, is that the language might arguably be more important of a component in terms of being able to, to get involved in kind of day-to-day -day happenings here um, that could be more limiting with this virtual format. Um, but we did, several of the interns were part of the an internal WhatsApp group we have at the Institute and also participated in some of our staff meetings, which is something that would happen if they were here on the ground. Um, so I wanna thank all of you for the different ways in which you are proactive about um, getting to know Monteverde and really um, seeking out more context for the research that you were doing. Um, and I'll be following up with all of you uh, on this subject of how to hopefully find more ways um, so people can really feel like they're, they're part of the community here um, beyond contributing research. Okay. Um, well, if there are no other comments, um, I'll say one last thank you to everyone. Thank you to all of our audience members. Um, I'm really uh, quite happy with the attendance that we had today. Um, so thank you for your questions um, and your presence. And uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, this has been recorded um, and will be made available. So you can also spread the word uh, to other folks who might be interested in seeing the presentations. Um, I again put the link in the chat uh, to the MVI Library Digital Collections where uh, all the reports from these projects will, will eventually be placed. Um, some are being finished up right now. And also a link to the virtual internships um, that we'd be happy for you to spread the word about. Um, so thank you to everyone and I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye. Thanks, Fern. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. Bye -bye. Good to see everyone. <laughs> Have a good one. Lori, hi and bye. Hi and bye. Thank you all. Oh. Thank you and bye. <laughs>